Hello everybody and welcome to Unit 1 of Jurisprudence 110. For this unit, you need to prepare Chapter 1 from your textbook. We find the law in everything around us. The workplace, on the road in a car, bus or train, the shops and restaurants that we go to, our agreements with service providers like gyms, cell phone companies, the university. We find the law in the rules that organize how we get married, how we get divorced, how we adopt children and even how we die. The law organizes our relationships with each other and with institutions and companies. It dictates how the government should operate and our position and status within the Republic of South Africa, but also within the world. The law seems to be everywhere and to permeate almost everything that we do. In Unit 1, we attempt to answer the question, what is the law? We will investigate the social contract as a possible explanation why society is willing to accept the law with its limitations and regulations on their freedom. We will investigate the sources of law and we will make a distinction between sources of law and religious, individual and community rules. We will ask whether the law can always provide us with legal certainty and we will make a connection between the law and justice. In this lecture, we will focus on the law, try and define what the law is, why we have law and explain why people are willing to accept the law. In this lecture, we will attempt to formulate a definition of what the law is and define the social contract of Hobbes, Locke and John Rawls. We will also formulate an African philosophical critique of the social contract and formulate some of the characteristics of the law. When we dissect this quote by Cicero, there are a number of important themes or characteristics that we can identify and that brings us a little closer to a definition of what the law is and what it can do for us. It seems the law is necessary to bring certainty and order to a society. That we can find the law in rules and regulations or commandments and prohibitions that are either written or unwritten. That justice can be obtained through the law and that those who do not abide by the law are considered to be unjust and disobedient or wicked. But why are people willing to give up their freedoms to a sovereign or to a state and to obey a certain rule or certain laws? To belong to a certain community or a society means that people have to live together and preferably live together in peace and prosperity. In order to achieve these goals, a society will find themselves in need of rules to organize and structure how their society will function. They need to agree with each other on the various rules that will be applicable to them and on what kind of rights each individual can obtain without infringing on the rights of others. This society also needs to choose people to enforce these rules, make new rules and lead the society forward. This kind of hypothetical agreement between the people of a particular society is called a social contract. And according to this contract, society agrees to act in a certain way, to acknowledge the chosen authority and to honor the rights of others in exchange for their own guaranteed freedoms and safety.
Various philosophers have tried to explain this agreement or social contract by explaining why and under which circumstances people will agree to enter into a social contract. Thomas Hobbes, a 17th century English philosopher, regarded the world as one of might and strife. According to him, the condition of man in his natural state is a condition of war of everyone against everyone. He believed that everyone had the fullest scope of freedoms and rights to do everything, but that, without laws and authority, people will continue to destroy each other. In order to sustain a lifestyle wherein people can function without living in a constant state of war, people are willing to give up their rights to everything and their unlimited freedoms to do as they please, in exchange for protection by an authority or the state. Man will do whatever it takes to protect his own life, and therefore he is willing to give up all his rights to the sovereign in exchange for protection against the might of other people. This authority or state will lay down rules to protect the people, but it demands absolute obedience and a complete surrender of individual freedoms. Hobbes' social contract, therefore, presupposes a natural state or condition wherein individuals want to live as unrestricted as possible, but wherein they realize that they need the state to protect them from each other. They are therefore willing to give up all their unfettered freedom to the state and to become completely obedient to the state in return for full protection from the state. Another English philosopher, John Locke, held a more optimistic view of the natural state or condition of man. According to Locke, human beings are rational and therefore they will have respect for rights. Similar to Hobbes' natural state, individuals act on their own behalf, but because they want to continue living a peaceful and prosperous existence and want to enjoy their property, they are willing to submit to the will of the majority through a chosen government. Different to Hobbes, the state does not become the sovereign and individuals do not have to give up all their freedoms in return for protection. Locke introduces the idea of tacit consent, wherein it presupposes that an individual consents tacitly to the government that represents the majority, and that those who do not wish to consent could withdraw from society and live elsewhere. For Locke, the government or state is not the supreme power, as the power remains with the people who can, if self-preservation demands it, revolt against the government. John Rawls tried to formulate a social contract which is more concerned with justice and fairness for everyone. His natural state looks different to both Locke and Hobbes, as he uses the metaphor of a veil of ignorance to explain a hypothetical situation wherein everybody is born without knowing what the future may bring. Everybody, in other words, start from the same place without any idea of their status, financial position, potential or individual characteristics. From this original position, individuals have to negotiate with each other and with the state for the minimum core conditions that they want to live under. Individuals are willing to reach an agreement or a contract with the state and to give up their unbridled freedoms in exchange for these minimum core conditions necessary to live a life of prosperity and peace. We have seen that there are many theories around the idea of the social contract, but that they have two things in common. Firstly, that individuals live in a natural state or come from an original position, and that they are willing to negotiate with the state and enter into a fictitious or imagined social contract or agreement. 
the epilogue of the interim constitution tells us that this constitution lies the secure foundation for the people of South Africa to transcend the divisions and strife of the past, and that these can now be addressed on the basis that there is a need for understanding but not vengeance, a need for reparation but not for retaliation, and a need for Ubuntu but not for victimization. Although there does not seem to be one definition for Ubuntu, it has something to do with an African worldview or way in which Africans see the world and is represented by values like personhood, humanity and morality. An African explanation of an approach to law would therefore look a little different to the perception of a Western lawmaker or a Western philosopher. Ubuntu presupposes that our natural state is one in which we live with respect and consideration for each other because we are all human beings. We are connected to each other and born within a community from which we can never truly be separated. What is good for the community will then be good for the individual and we will live in a kind of society underlined by the principles of sharing and equal respect for each other. We have explained some of the theories around why individuals who live as societies are willing to enter into a hypothetical agreement or contract with the state in order to live lives of peace and prosperity. So what are some of the characteristics of the law that we can identify from our discussion about the social contract? We see that a society needs to be organized and to provide a safe and certain environment for its members. That the law contains rules and principles that are necessary to ensure this safe environment by directing and facilitating human interaction. These rules and principles are agreed upon by the individual members of the society and they also choose a government to enforce these rules and to sanction those who are not compliant with the rules. The government will also make rules and be the judge in instances where the rules were not followed or where there exist discrepancies around the law in order to provide certainty to the members of society. In this lecture, we attempted to formulate a definition of what the law is, and we defined the social contract and distinguished between the social contracts of Hobbes, Locke and Rawls. We formulated an African philosophical critique of the social contract, and lastly we formulated some of the characteristics of the law 